everyone and welcome back to the channel. Um, it's been a bit of a break so um, hello to all my uh, regulars and subscribers and to anyone who's visiting for the first time, welcome. Uh, today I'm going to take us back a little way into the past to show you a game which I think is one of the best um, simulations of man-to-man -man infantry combat out there. Um, it has a very long pedigree. It was first introduced in 1983 by the Avalon Hill Games Company and created something of a storm when it first appeared. Now, I'm going to put you out of your suspense. Those of you who are experienced gamers may have already heard of this title. Some of you may have even played it. Others may know of it. I am speaking, of course, of Upfront the um, so-called squad leader card game. Now, just to give this uh, a bit of context and to uh, help you understand why it was so controversial when it first came out, was uh, Upfront appeared at a time when wargaming was very much a board game affair. Um, it was the great era of hexagon maps, extremely detailed unit rules where morale would be calculated through a series of complex tables, firepower would be calculated more often than not by different weapons and their various attributes, and it was the, the age of pursuit of realism through detail, and that resulted in a great deal of complication. Now a card game I mean, there was not very much in this box, as you'll see in a moment. A card game at this time surely could not deliver that level of complexity or, or realism that was required uh, to, to simulate a man-to-man a, 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 a -man, you know, squad-level firefight in World War II. How could you do this? And to link this game to Squad Leader, now Squad Leader is in some ways the epitome of the ultra detailed um, squad based war game. It still has its adherence, it's a very strong title, but it's hugely complicated and it's not for the faint hearted. Now, war games at this time they were drifting into the use of cards, but you, you would find few gamers who would seriously consider any of the card, card war games out there, proper games. I mean, an example of a contemporary game is Avalon Hill's Naval War, which has been reissued a few times more recently under different names. Um, but essentially that was a bit of a free-for-all naval battle, and its, its very faint claim to realism was that certain cards were based on historical warships and had certain traits that were realistic to a degree, but it was very, very simplistic. Upfront was different. Upfront was a card game that somehow packed tons of realism, um, as it was understood at the time. Lots of charts, tables, accounting for different weaponry, terrain. I mean, there was a big no-no. How, how on earth do you represent terrain without a board, without, uh, with, without hexagons, with, without some kind of way of measuring distance. Well, the way Upfront did this uh, was really quite clever. Crucially, there is no board in Upfront. It is well and truly a card game. If you look at the back of the box, you get a sense for what the components are. There are two types of cards in the deck, in the included decks. We'll, we'll get a closer look at these in a minute. Um, there's cards which cover terrain as well as actions. And there's each nation's unit cards. In addition to this, there was just a plethora of counters to cover various detail. But that was it. For the early 1980s, for something that had claims to be a war game, this was pretty bold stuff. You know, a, a lot of people were surprised. Um, some perhaps even expected this thing to fall on its face. It wouldn't have been the first time a, a, an Avalon Hill publication or indeed other game companies' publications had claimed they could do something and hadn't quite made it. And the, um, the claims that the designers made for this game 
were itself quite bold. Now I'm going to um, I'm going to um, read the first paragraph that's on the back of this box, and you can see what I mean about how they've nailed their colours to the mast. Um, please bear with me. Only once in a great while does a game dare to be truly different and abandon old concepts while striking out to chart virgin territory in game design. Rarer still are the instances in which these games succeed in presenting a simulation of unparalleled realism in an easily comprehended and playable format. In Upfront, we have just such a game. Gone are the hexes and charts of conventional war games, replaced by innovative and attractive... I'm going to stop myself there. It was 1983. That was attractive. Innovative and attractive game components which have distilled a wealth of technical data into one of the most playable yet detail-laden formats ever designed. Wow. Um, what I find even more incredible is, as I say, I'll go into the details of what these cards denote, but I just want to draw your attention to that. Recommended for two or more players of um, ages 12 and up. I mean, I barely remember what games I was playing in 1983. I think I was a few years off trying Axis and Allies for the first time, but try getting 12 year olds to play this. Uh, it is actually possible, difficult but possible, but a little bit of forcing is involved. I didn't say that. But um, enough about that. Um, before I move on from the box and the 1980s uh, artwork, um, Let's just have a quick look at the components, shall we? Get some idea of how this game substantiates its claims. So the first thing you're confronted by is the rule book. Now, to players unused to war games, a rule book like this could be absolutely terrifying. Look at that. Bearing in mind this is a card game, just look at all of that. But what I find ingenious about this is that it is a programmed rule book, so you don't need to sit down and learn all this at one go. The basic game, given its depth, I agree with the claim about depth and realism, this game is remarkably easy to learn in its basics, its very bare bones. What is difficult is keeping track of the myriad of optional and more advanced rules and a lot of exceptions and subcases. The further you get into the game, the rulebook encourages you to play the easy missions first and gradually bolt on other things as you go on. So you start off in the early scenarios with basic squads armed with the basic equipment of their nation, usually rifles and machine pistols. As you gain in confidence through the, uh, uh, um, your first few games, eventually they will introduce new things. They'll introduce new weapons, they'll introduce armoured fighting vehicles. And if you get to the very end, there's rules for playing campaigns, for playing linked missions. One of the great strengths of this game is just how incredibly adaptable it is. There are, at the end of the rule book basic scenarios with all the special rules, um, summaries of the squads you require, um, attacker and defender notes, different force makeup, but you can make up your own and there are actually a huge, huge wealth of fan-made scenarios out there, easily downloadable from the internet, Board Game Geek among many other sites. Upfront still has a lot of followers, I am one of many, um, who are happily writing new scenarios even now for it. So there is a lot of life in this game. Now, the, I should mention that the basic game, the original game, came with only three nationalities. It was very Europe-centred. So 
They started with the United States, Germany and the Soviet Union. Those were the core combatants. The first expansion, which I'm glad to say I have, apologies for the uh, slightly stereotyped 1980s artwork, but again, um, it's a product of its time. Banzai introduced the Japanese and the British with unique faction rules for both sides, but they didn't go too mad with it. This was the beauty of the balance of this game. The faction rules required some tweaking of the basic game system, but not a huge amount. It's not a deal breaker. And like the rule book uh, for the original game, it comes with an awful lot of history. Um, lots of detail about force organisation, unit organisation, tables of equipment, you name it. A third expansion, which I regret I don't own, Desert War, introduced the Italians and the French. Um, many regard this as the weakest of the three. Um, I've never played either of those nations, so I don't know. But I have downloaded the rules for deserts and desert terrain and its effects on combat. And they're pretty good. I mean, it's allowed me to make some interesting scenarios uh, to pit my British against the Germans. So much for the rule book. What about the cards? Well, here is the card for an American soldier. I'll see if the camera can focus. Now, some people who have looked at the uh, uh, graphics have likened this game to a weird sort of monopoly at war and I can see what they're getting at. It's the classic monopoly um, properties type format. So each of these cards represents a soldier who's laid out in front of you on the table. This is his unpinned side. So you've got his name of course, you've got the weapon he's armed with in case a Garand rifle got the amount of firepower he generates at different ranges, his morale, his uh, points value, and his killed in action rating. That's how much it takes to um, score a hit, a, a lethal hit on him. If you pin him, he loses most of his stats and he only keeps his panic and his killed in action value, his close combat value, which is printed up there, uh, is affected. And that is his uh, route level. If, if he suffers further damage, which routes him, um, then that, that shows what, what triggers him breaking and fleeing and going enough is enough. Each individual in the game has very, a, a, a good, Rain, there's a oh, sorry. What am I trying to say? There is a range of personalities in these in this game. Some soldiers have good morale ratings, others are less brave. They come with a range of weaponry. In fact, each nation, as you can see, there, there's a variety here, gives you the options for creating early war squads, late war squads. The sky is the limit, and the amount of weaponry on display is. Quite frankly, incredible. The United States even has a couple of early war US Marines armed with the good old Springfield rifle, and you can build a squad around those. There are also armoured vehicles, so to take an example from the Germans, slightly larger card, as you can see, the good old SDKFZ. It, um, it has its stats laid out in very much the same way as the infantry cards. Uh, except vehicles have a few extra wrinkles to them. So there's the um, there's the bog rating for getting bogged down in difficult terrain. There's their armor rating, which uh, I'm not sure how clear that is, but basically there's multiple figures for their armor rating, um, depending on whether it's a frontal hit or a flank hit. Um, so there's there's a lot going on, as you can see. And Open-topped armoured fighting vehicles can be pinned, just like infantry units. Now, something a bit beefier and meaner, let's pick on a Panzer III here, can button up rather than being pinned. But of course, if you button up, it affects your combat rating. 
I'm not going to blather on too much about the intricacies of the rules because as you've seen there are a lot and I will be doing in my next video a demonstration of a turn or two of the game to show that despite the density of the rules it can actually be a pretty fast flowing and tense game. I'm just going to show you a couple of the um, unit counters. Um, so these are from the British set. That's a grouping marker, because of course when you lay your squads on the table in front of you, you don't have them all in a bunch. You can if you want to, but that reduces your tactical options. It's not such a good idea. And you get penalised for bunching up in the game. It's better to spread out, which is true to life. Um, so that's how to identify your groups with markers like these. Um, your men can drop their weapons if they're fatalities or, or in other circumstances if they voluntarily abandon them. There are some times in the game where you do want to do that. If someone else has lost a better weapon, you might want to seize it. So the weapons have their own counters which you can use to denote dropped weapons. Weapons can also jam or break in this game. And so you've got a malfunction side to the counters. I hope that's focusing. It might not be. Yes. Um, so there's a malfunction side to every weapon showing what you need to achieve to repair it. And so on and so forth. Um, in terms of information markers, there are a myriad of things for transferring men between groups flanking fire, marking men as infiltrators if they're trying to get into an enemy position to either, either enhance their firepower or to enter close combat. The effects of star shell, if you're playing a night scenario, there are rules for that. The effects of being wounded. So they have largely thought of everything. This, this is a very impressive achievement, this card game. Before I wrap up, let's have a look at the action cards. Now these are very much the heart of the game, along with your unit cards. Nationalities in this game are very cleverly represented in terms of their doctrinal differences and their level of training and equipment by designated hand sizes, draw rates and discard rates for different nationalities. So for example, the United States generally has a six card hand. They can discard two cards only if they've taken no actions. The Germans, by contrast, have a five card hand, but they can discard a card regardless of how many actions they've taken. So that instantly gives you a very different feel to the two sides. The Germans have fewer options, which accounts for the fact that in the period covered by the core game, really 1940, to late 42 to, uh, to 45, the Germans generally had either a bit less equipment uh, and also diminishing options, especially as you get to 1944 onwards. But they have a very high level of training and tactical flexibility, hence the ability to discard a card and cycle more cards through their deck. The United States, by contrast, better equipped, good level of training, but if they're stuck in a situation that they don't cope so well with, uh, then it takes them a while to dig themselves out of that. They can either excel or they might not do so well. And so you have cards for shooting, concealment cards for reacting to an opponent. There's terrain, you can occupy buildings. Friction of war. Hero cards, abruptly one of your men can double their firepower. There's also split cards to allow you to either move or cower. And again, here's another clever wrinkle, nation specific. The Germans and the Soviet Union have a little bit more mobility than the United States. The United States, in certain circumstances, is a lot more cautious. And that reflects 
a general reluctance. Uh, uh, I wouldn't say a reluctance to commit because that makes them sound bad. It's an emphasis on preserving life, if possible. Unlike Germany and the Soviet Union, the US armed forces are not going to chuck men's lives away for no good purpose. Um, the other two factions, of course, allow that, particularly the Soviet Union, where there's a special rule for voluntarily panicking or killing men in order to allow the rest of your squad to advance. And there's even a commissar card in the Soviet deck. So if they need a bit of extra encouragement, that's an option too. Um, movement. These are very flexible, these cards. They can be played that way to order your men to advance, that way to order lateral movement, or that way to order them to perform retrograde or retreat move. So a lot happens in this, um, in this game through the use of these cards. This game is diceless. I'm just going to touch on that before I finish off. So each card has a large number in its top right hand corner and that is a random number which covers anything from repair attempts, entrenchments, shooting. There's also a series of random numbers at the bottom which are positional random numbers so they are used in a myriad of situations. So let's say a sniper targets a five man group and scores a hit. You draw a card from the draw deck, cross reference the five column in this instance, he would be aiming at soldier number three in the group. Um, these letters all denote something. So B is for bog check for vehicles. Um, w is for wire. It's a bog check if you're pinned in wire. R is for routing if your men are doing that morale test when they're pinned. So these cards cover absolutely everything. And those of you who have played other games, more recent games, like um, I, I think uh, Combat Commander is one, will recognise some homages. Um, there's also games like With the Old Breed, Solitaire game, uh, the use of random numbers on the cards in order to generate combat results and morale results. There, there were a lot of ideas that originated with Upfront, which live on in some rather successful titles today. So I hope that's uh, given you a feel for what you get in the box for Upfront. The game makes some very bold claims about itself. Um, I freely admit I'm a fan. I think that the game does a really good job of um, doing what it sets out to do. There is a complexity cost, but you know you sort of have to accept that if you're going to bill yourself as an accurate simulation of man-to-man -man combat. In my next video, I'm going to set up a scenario and I'm just going to walk you all through the gameplay. I'm going to do my best to explain decisions, explain how the mechanisms work, and hopefully give you a good sense of how this game flows and how it plays. But for the meantime, thank you very much for tuning in.